Okay. So uh, before we start, just a few words about uh, what I'm doing here. Um, this internship is part of Create Mia um, program. Uh, which is a collaboration between a few universities in Quebec and a few industrial um, partners. And I come from McGill and I've been uh, doing my internship here in ORS. So this presentation um, is um, divided into two parts. The first part I will be talking about deep learning. And in the second part, I will talk about uh, the project itself, what I'm doing here, and how I'm doing this. So let's start from uh, deep learning. Why all people talk about deep learning nowadays? So if you look in news, you will see a lot of articles uh, naming big uh, companies and deep learning in the same uh, titles. So it's a very, very hot subject. And if you look in uh, what companies are there using deep learning for their products, you see really big names like Microsoft, IBM, Google, Amazon, and uh, many others. Um, if you look at academia, you will see a few uh, big centers um, here in North America, uh, probably the biggest one is here in Montreal, uh, led by Joshua Bengio. There is a center called MILA, uh, Montreal uh, Institute for Learning Algorithms, I think, and it counts 71 members. Um, there is another one in uh, Toronto, uh, 47 people. There is in Stanford, 36 people. And there's another one big in New York University. Could not get the list of members, so I don't know exactly how many people work in there, but this um, probably is the biggest in academia. So a lot of money, a lot of funding going there. If you look in Google search and um, deep learning, um, interest, like this is a general audience being just searching in Google search, you see dramatic increase over the last few years. And there are a lot of areas where deep learning is used or try, uh, people trying to use. And you, uh, I can list a few, speech recognition, image recognition, image segmentation, image to text translation, visual question answering, automatic translation, and even uh, generating things like automatic handwriting generation, automatic game playing. And I uh, um, left these dots because I really could continue this list. It's um, here is one example where deep learning uh, is used. Um, the grayscale images are being colorized. So, uh, this means you take the grayscale image, you pass it through the deep network, and you get a color uh, image. Uh, now, here you see uh, this is the output of the network. This is the real image uh, what, that was expected. And in this case, these are old um, photos taken before the color image was even existing. And here is a very realistic output of what they could be looking if they were taken by color uh, camera. Another example, image captioning or image to text. When uh, there is an image that is passed through the network and there is a text annotation describing what is this image about. This is for blind people, like reading the image for blind people. So there are a few examples that it works not that great, like this a yellow school bus parked in the parking lot. This is not a bus, but still. But there's a few examples that you can see, like really uh, amazing job was done. A person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road or a group of young people playing a game of frisbee. So it works. Uh, in medical image analysis, deep learning uh, was not very well accepted for a long time uh, because of two reasons. Conceptual, uh, the deep learning is too abstract and medical image analysis people say we 
don't want this abstraction. We want to understand what we are doing, what we are analyzing. So conceptually, it's not accepted. And also practically, in the medical um, field, there's not a lot of training data available. There's not a lot of uh, labeled data, and we will talk about this later. So there were these two main reasons that uh, deep learning was not very welcomed in medical image analysis field. But even here, the picture started changing. Um, if you look at um, big workshops in uh, medical image analysis, such as Mackay, for those who doesn't know, it's the International Conference on Medical Image Computing and Computer Assisted Intervention, which is held from uh, 1998, very uh, big conference. And from 2015, they started to uh, have workshops on deep learning there. And another big conference, SBI, had a um, deep learning tutorial this uh, spring. So it comes to medical image analysis as well. And there are uh, already um, papers published that do uh, deep learning. Not that uh, the percentage is not that big as if you look at like other fields, but still, a uh, few years ago, they were all rejected, but now it's changed. Uh, there are few startups doing medical image analysis that um, declare themselves dedicated to deep learning. I was able to find two, uh, one uh, called Analytic in San Francisco and another one is Emagia here in Montreal. And Analytic um, says on their website, deep learning technology can save lives by helping detect curable diseases early. This is their um, uh, motivation and they're trying to do some product that will support end-to-end -end radiologist workflow and here in Imagia um, they try to do uh, um, artificial intelligence against cancer they <coughs> um, specifically um, focus on cancer and everything that it involves cancer detection cancer segmentation cancer classification and follow-ups so these are two startups, uh, both founded in 2014 and working in medical image analysis and doing deep learning uh, only. So what is deep learning? Deep learning is a set of algorithms. Um, it's a branch of machine learning that attempts to model high level abstractions in data by using a deep graph with multiple processing layers composed of multiple linear and non-linear transformation. This is a definition I took from Wikipedia. The main points here, it's, it learns abstractions, multiple levels of abstractions in linear and non-linear transformation. Or in short, deep learning is a set of machine learning algorithms based on learning multiple levels of abstractions. That's it. Uh, so what we are dealing here, basically uh, we have some data uh, usually a lot of data um, and we know the output over this data. For example, we know that all these images are cats and all these images are dogs. And what we want to learn is a transformation. What function can map from output, uh, from data, sorry, to output, so that given a new, never seen image, our program will say if it's dog or cat. This is what machine learning is about. So there are a few approaches that we can solve this problem. A uh, very naive approach would be rule-based systems. You say, okay, if you see X, Y, Z, say it's cat. If you see something else, say it's dog. And you define the rules. You define what the program should be looking uh, in, uh, in these uh, images. There's no machine learning in this uh, system. Machine, classic machine learning approach would take the input image, would translate it into some uh, set of features that describe this input, learn the function that maps from these features to the output. This is what classic machine learning does. Now, the problem is that uh, often we have no idea which features we need to use. So, uh, we just try a lot of different features 
we learn different mappings and we see what does better. This is the main uh, approach we can take in this case. There are few attempts to learn representation before we um, uh, start uh, using the classifier, uh, start learning the classifier. Uh, mainly it's like dictionary learning or if uh, anyone knows like bag of words models or things like this. When you actually, what you do, you do extract some basic features, but then you try to apply some methods to learn um, some representation over these features. And then you use this representation and uh, try to learn your mapping. Now, finally, we come to the deep learning. And what deep learning does, instead of this two uh, um, um, steps, I would say instead of these main steps, it learns automatically uh, levels of different uh, representations. So you can do as many levels as you wish and it goes from uh, most simple features to more complex features and it's all done automatically. There is no uh, manual feature extraction, uh, in extraction involved here. You just take the input image as is, you run it through your deep learning um, network and you get some output. So this is the main difference of deep learning from other systems. Now, this is an example of uh, different levels of features learned. This is a database of faces. So you see in layer one, you learn simple features like ages. Then in next level, you have object parts, kind of, and these are combined in layer three to some objects. So it's increasing level of um, abstraction. But okay, we see that it's long different levels of abstraction, but is it good? Why is it good? So um, the motivation go into deep uh, architectures um, could be various. Like brain has deep architecture. If you look at the brain, we have some uh, um, processing in retina, then it's processed in retina uh, in area V1, area V2, area V4. So we say, okay, brain has uh, signal processing in some deep network. Uh, cognitive processes are deep. Humans learn simple concepts first and then compose them to represent more abstract ones, for example, or engineers break solution into multiple levels of abstraction and processing. So it's, it looks very uh, intuitive that we need to process uh, things um, in deep networks. The board is compositional. If you look at images, we can say, okay, images uh, um, cons image consists of basic uh, units as pixels, which could be combined into edges, text on motif, parts and finally we can uh, extract objects. And the same in speech or in text. So everything is compositional, everything is hierarchical. And also computationally uh, we have advantage to go deep. It was shown that some function cannot be efficiently represented with shallow architecture when the number of nodes may grow exponentially if we only um, uh, remove one layer, meaning if we have more layers, we can represent the function with linear number of nodes. If we remove layer, we need exponential number of nodes. So compute computationally, it's much more intense. But why does it work so well? Well, there are intrinsic and ex uh, external factors that explain the success of deep learning. Uh, internally, it works well because it does end-to-end -end training. It gets raw input, it outputs some um, uh, function, and all the steps in between are optimized together. So we don't do, uh, okay, let's try these features, and then we try this classifier, then let's switch the classifier. Probably this classifier will work, better, will work better with other features. So there's a lot of game here. And in the case of deep learning, it's all optimized together. Uh, also, there, uh, we have arbitrary number of abstraction levels, so we can go as deep as we need for the uh, problem we try to solve. So this explains why it uh, works well. But also there are external factors. Like 
um, nowadays we have a lot of training data, like uh, a lot of videos in YouTube, if images in Instagram, a lot of social uh, medias. This all training data was not once available. And also we have good computational power like GPUs that we did not have once. So I will um, also uh, talk about this a bit later. So what, how deep learning um, was um, invited and discovered. There's a short story about deep learning that you might see in uh, many presentations. They say, okay, in 2006, there was a big breakthrough. Uh, there were three uh, major uh, um, papers published. And then there is uh, after and before. And uh, I would say it's very short history of deep learning. And this is uh, usually um, told by one of these three people. And um, there is a sentence that said, okay, the uh, history is written by winners. Okay, obviously they were winners and they told, uh, tell the history that they like to tell. We were the inventors of deep learning. But I say, okay, there is another long story about deep learning. So it all starts from biology. We, what we want, we want uh, to solve artificial intelligence, right? We want to make a machine to do something that human brains uh, do. So let's understand how um, human brains work and then do the same. So uh, they started look, people started looking on neurons, which is an electrically excitable cell that processes and transmits information in the brain. And they, uh, neurons have different shapes and sizes, and they have uh, different classes, but they can be connected to each other to form neural networks. This is, the, this is a known fact about how the brain works. So uh, there has been a, a few attempts to model how um, the neurons work. And the first biological neuron model, this is a model that explains the uh, human brain, one of the first uh, models was proposed in 1907, and it's called Integrate and Fire. What they told is that there are inputs into the neuron, and what neuron does, it integrates or sums uh, the inputs, and when it reaches some threshold, the neuron fires. There is a spike. So this is a very simple model trying to explain how the neuron works. In 1943, there was the first model of artificial neuron. Now we want to make a neuron. We want to make something that would um, simulate um, brain activity. And uh, the model was very simple and very similar to what the uh, integrate and fire said. We have a sum of two inputs. It was very simple model restricted to inputs, uh, to binary inputs. There is summation and then it goes to some um, step function. If it's below the threshold, it's zero. If it's um, uh, above the threshold, it's one. So this is the first artificial neuron model. And the main problem is has no learning. It's very simple. It's good because it can represent and or or not with a single neuron or with a, a network of such neurons you could represent any Boolean function. And this model is known today as a logical gate or linear threshold gate. There are different names to this model. But the important thing is it has no learning. All the weights should be uh, predefined. The weight and the threshold. So a few years after, in 1957, uh, Frank Rosenblatt came with a model of perceptron. This is an improved model. It's enabled a few um, inputs. It's put weights on different inputs, different weights, and it's used a different uh, bit, different function here. But the main ideas were the same. The main advantage of this model, it's also proposed uh, automatically adaptive weights. 
So it was intended to be machine. It was not a prob uh, program. The perceptron was the machine, and the machine updated its ways um, by itself, not very, not in a very smart way, but still it tried to. In 1958, one year after, there was a big press conference, and after this, New York Times published a sentence that said that uh, the perceptron is the embryo of an electronic computer that will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. Very promising sentence. People believed in this. People really believed. So a lot of money was put in uh, um, uh, in this area. Everyone wanted to make this happen. Uh, probably the major thing that we could um, uh, remember during this um, time that in 1965 already there was first deep network with three layers and a few years after there was a, a deep network with eight layers. It was not trained the same way we train today, but it was deep network. He trained it layer by layer. He used supervised uh, training. He used statistical methods at each uh, layer to learn weights. And it did happen long, long before 2006. So in 1969, uh, people started um, to think, oh, probably this sentence, probably this idea will never happen. And then there was a very famous uh, book published called Perceptrons. There was a controversy if the author said that a XOR function could not be um, uh, modeled with one layer or with uh, any number of layers. There was a big controversy about this. And a lot of people blame this book that uh, the uh, time of neural networks ended, more or less. But uh, the truth is that by that time, by 1969, there were a few problems that prevented neural networks from developing. They did not know how to train these uh, networks e uh, efficiently. They did not have enough data to avoid overfitting. They did not have the computational power to be able to train deep network. Uh, they were very concerned with uh, local minima problems that this uh, training will co uh, converge to local minima and will not uh, launch the global uh, optimal uh, solution. And another big problem that there were support vector machines that were proposed in 1963 and they worked. They worked well and neural networks were not that much successful. So what's next? Okay, we won't have artificial intelligence solved with neural networks, so what? There's no more research? Okay, so there's no more money, let's say, but there is a research. There is a research. And a lot of very important things happened after this. Uh, there was backpropagation algorithm. Uh, it was in reinvented a few times. People did it uh, independently and they were not aware of other people who already solved this. They solved this with different approaches, but this was the basic idea of the same back propagation algorithms. It happened in 1970 and 1974, at least two times, probably more. Uh, first convolutional neural network was already um, trained in 1980. And uh, some other um, important architectures of deep networks were proposed during this time, like uh, recurrent neural networks, which have some uh, memory state. And layer by layer pre-training approaches were developed for this uh, recurrent neural network already in 1992. So they, people did do layer by layer training on uh, some and deep networks. And then comes 2006 and these three major and very important papers. What do they propose in these three papers? They propose to do unsupervised learning in uh, 
each layer. They propose to use uh, to train each one layer at a time on top of previously trained ones, and the representation learned at each level is used for the next layer. And finally, use supervised training to fine tune all the layers together. It is so much innovative if you look on all the long history. Okay. I would say it's just the right time came for the neural network, for the deep uh, networks. So um, if we remember this, uh, why uh, deep learning works so well, there are external factors uh, that deep uh, networks need a lot of training data and they really need good computational power and we finally have this. So all these concerns are no more concerns. If we don't, uh, if we cannot uh, model some function with one layer, okay, just go as deep as you wish. Uh, no effective learning algorithm was solved by backpropagation and layer by layer training. We once did not have enough data to avoid overfitting. Now we have so many data, GPUs. Um, local minima turned out not to be that big problem in high dimensional space and support vector machines are doing much better than one or two layer uh, networks, but that's the limit. The support vector machines have depths of two. With neural networks, you can go much deeper. So support vector machine is no more trendy. Uh, this is explanation why local minima is not a problem because in uh, high dimensions you have what's called saddle points. You, it's very uh, uh, not that much realistic that you have all the dimensions going to the minima at the same time. What you do have that one or two or a few dimensions going to the minima. So you have kind of saddle. This is the name where it comes from. So you optimize on all the dimensions. It's unlikely that you get stuck in some bad local minima. Okay, how does it work? A bit of math, not too much, I promise, just a general uh, ideas. Uh, so it's all started from perceptron. Uh, we say this is a model, we have uh, inputs multiple inputs or with weights that are summed and then it goes through some function that outputs zero or one or minus one, a plus one in this case. Um, the biological explanation to the perceptron, you could see th this is the body of the neuron, so it makes summation. There are inputs uh, from different uh, neurons these are the, uh, the inputs, x's. There is uh, this function uh, on axon. I'm not very good in biology, but I... And there's finally the output that goes to another neuron. So there is a very plausible biological explanation to the uh, perceptron. This is another way to see the same uh, picture. And mathematically, this is just simple linear classifier. All this uh, thing does is um, uh, defining some uh, uh, line that divides uh, one class from another, either you are plus one or minus one. And the weights, weights W, define which line you take. So there could be a different lines, different uh, splits of the data. And the purpose of the learning is to learn the best one. So you learn the weights, you actually learn which line splits your example in the best way. So when you see unseen example, which probably here, where do you classify it? On, each si on which side of the line? This is a mathematical uh, explanation, the perceptron. The same thing, just visualized differently. We have uh, inputs here, then we take these two operations and merge them into one node and take the output. Meantime, this is just the perceptron. Now from the perceptron, I build my neural network. I just have a lot of uh, units, a lot of perceptrons, which are all connected 
to all inputs and all connected to the output. This is feed forward neural network with one hidden layer. This is hidden layer. This is input layer and this is output layer. We can have more hidden layers, as many as we wish. This is the neural network feed forward because all the data flows feed forward. Okay, this is the name. Uh, what is the back propagation? Back propagation is a method to learn the weight. Uh, the full name is backward propagation of error. It uh, requires a few things to know uh, to do the learning, for example, optimization method, how you optimize uh, your loss function, which is also can be different uh, things, you decide. You need obviously labeled examples to learn from them. And there are also uh, extra parameters to be decided, learning rate, momentum, just a few examples. So you need to decide a lot of things and then you just use the pattern. What the pattern is, for example, if you use gradient descent, you have an update weights rule, which is just trying to go on uh, uh, the optimal um, uh, direction uh, uh, to minimize uh, the cost function. So you just go in uh, down direction, you take step, step in this direction. So you need to know uh, error function, which would measure some distance between predicted and desirable outcome 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 sorry and you need to be able to calculate partial derivatives of this uh, error function with respect to any weight in your network so how you can do this using the chain rule so you start from some initialization you have to start from something the simplest way is just to put random weights all over the network then you have your input uh, data. You run it through your network. You just, this is my input. I calculate my function. So I know the values here. I know the values in the next layer. And finally, I get with, uh, some output. Let's say I predicted this is a cat. Oh, I have an error. So the true value is it was supposed to be dog. So I have some error or some cost function associated with this error. And this function is a function of true value and predicted value. Now, the true value is given by uh, example, by my data. And the predicted value is some function, which I know how it's calculated, is some function of all these weights. So I can take derivatives of my error with respect to any of these weights, right? Great. I go back and this level, I know how this WK plus one was calculated. This is very known function of all these weights, all the incoming inputs. So I can take derivative of my error function with respect to any of these weights using the chain rule. And this is the whole idea of the backward propagation. Once you calculated this uh, partial derivatives, you make a step in minimizing your cost function. You update your weights and you start from uh, the beginning. So this is an idea of uh, uh, back propagation. And the last thing we need to know uh, uh, this is activation functions. Okay, you remember in every uh, node, oh, sorry, it's clicked. In every node, we have summation and then we have some function. It's, this is called activation function. At the beginning, it used to be a simple step function. Then uh, for a very long time, sigmoid function was used. And in last few years, there's a very trendy ReLU function, rectified linear unit. And this is like the last two, three years, everyone uses this function. Very trendy. So this is some basics how uh, uh, neural networks 
work, how deep lo uh, learning works. And uh, let's see a few examples of different uh, neural networks. So here, major uh, architectures, main types of uh, deep networks uh, you can uh, encourage. So there is a restricted Boltzmann machine, which is a generative stochastic neural network. There is deep belief networks. This is a graphical model, which predicts uh, some latent uh, variables. There is a convolutional neural network, which is widely used in uh, image analysis. This is a type of feedforward artificial neural network in which the connectivity pattern between its neurons is, is inspired by the organization of the animal visual cortex. In particular, it is inspired by um, retinal uh, um, fields of view. So um, this is very popular in uh, image analysis. There's another um, uh, major type which called autoencoder. It's uh, used. It uses unsupervised learning to uh, learn efficient uh, coding or efficient re representation uh, of the data. And there is also recurrent neural network, which has some uh, um, memory. Uh, element. It uh, has um, directed cycles of connections in the neural network. So we have some memory introduced. It's good for uh, data streams, probably in videos or whatever, when you need, want to have some memory in your uh, between your inputs. So let's look at uh, convolutional neural network. This is uh, one that you will uh, need mostly for uh, images. So as I told, it is inspired by uh, visual mechanism of visual cortex in the brain. It's uh, based on the idea of receptive fields. I don't know if uh, many of you know what receptive field is, but it says, okay, in, the, in our brain, in the retina, we have cells that only um, uh, look at some uh, limited um, uh, space and they fire uh, if they find some pattern in this space. So it's like special, uh, specially distributed units. So in order to build the convolutional neural network, we need uh, two main building blocks, the convolution operation and the pooling or subsampling. This is an example of convolutional neural network proposed in 1998. It's called LANET 5, it's the fifth uh, version, I guess. And all it has is convolutions and some samplings repeated. And this was developed to recognize uh, digits or letters uh, in the image. So what is convolution? Um, convolution is a small um, kernel, which is, uh, you can see it is shifted over your main image and calculating some uh, dot products of this small window. So uh, it could be seen as a filter. And if you have a few layers of uh, convolution, the first convolution layer will extract low level features like edges, lines, corners, and then as you go higher, you will get more uh, high level features. This is an example of edge detector, for example. This is made with convolution. So this is an input image, this is a convolution kernel, and this is what you get. So if you compare it to a uh, traditional feedforward net, uh, neural network when we told every unit is connected to all the inputs. Here we only have units connected to a few inputs. So this one is connected to this three, not connected to four, five, six, and seven. And if you see different colors, it means that the same color is, has the same weight. So the weights are shared. This um, actually uh, enables to detect the same pattern, never mind where it happens. So it's just the same way. It's effectively the same filter. Uh, pooling is just nonlinear down sampling. Uh, if you have um, this example, you could do, for example, different types of pooling. You could do average pooling when you take the average in the small window 
or you could take max pooling when you take the maximum in every window. And what it does, it reduces the resolution of the features. Why is it good? It's like kind of losing the information. So why is it good? Because it uh, makes the features robust against noise and some small distortions. So it's turned out to be very useful uh, operation. Another type of network that I was mentioning, autoencoders. So autoencoders consist of two parts. There's an encoder part and there's a decoder part. In the middle, you have your code learned. You have an input and output, which you want to be the same as your input. So you take your input, you run it through the network, and you want to be the output be identical as much as possible to your input. And what you get in the co in the middle is uh, much lower dimensionality uh, repre uh, representation of uh, your uh, data. So this is unsupervised. You don't need to know anything about your inputs. You don't need any labels. And there are different uh, types, uh, different variations of autoencoders, for example, denoising autoencoder, when you take some uh, corrupted image, run it through the network, and it predicts the original um, input as it uh, had to be. And there are sparse autoencoders that um, enforce this representation to be sparse. And this uh, uh, sparse uh, representation are good if you take them afterwards to the classification stage. So it is a useful thing uh, to do also. Uh, this is one uh, example of convolutional uh, neural network called UNET. It was published uh, last year uh, in the paper called Convolutional Networks for Biomedical Image Segmentations. Uh, it has uh, a lot of um, convolutional and poolings, and then up uh, convolutional, up convolutions, and up sampling, and some connections in between the layers. Um, so it could be seen as kind of uh, autoencoder because it's here you actually have some um, sparse, uh, not sparse, but some uh, minimized representation of your uh, input. Now they went with this uh, unit into uh, challenges and they won a few of them. They won uh, computer automated detection. Uh, of some cells and cell tracking challenge. So it is uh, uh, this uh, type of network works well for biomedical uh, data. Now, uh, as I told, like we have a lot of uh, data today, but most of the data we have is unlabeled. So it's true we have um, a lot of training examples. Uh, with labels, but should we just uh, discard all these unlabeled examples or could we use them somehow? This is the main question that um, last uh, um, few years, probably last two years even, uh, people are very concerned and trying to, uh, to propose new methods. So they uh, started to use terms called uh, semi-supervised learning when they use both uh, labeled and unlabeled data in the same in the same time and trying to optimize both uh, simultaneously so they call this semi supervised learning and this is a, a one of the architectures that was proposed for this semi supervised learning it's called ladder network and if you see it has two outputs one for supervised and one for unsupervised one labeled and one unlabeled uh, example it could be also seen as a stacked uh, stack of uh, autoencoders but this is just a recent direction uh, so how to build a good deep network? We've seen so many things. We've seen the different architectures. Now I have a problem. How do I solve this with deep network? Okay, I need to choose architecture. I need to choose how many layers I use. I need to choose which layers, in what order. I need to choose a lot of parameters per uh, each uh, layer. For example, what is the kernel size for convolution? Even if I know I want to use convolutional network, what is the right kernel size? Is it two by two, three by three, five by five? 
should I use max pooling or average pooling? Again, what kernel size should I use? What learning rates are? What is batch size? What are other things? There are many, many things to decide. How do I choose them? I just try and see how it works. There are no good ways to choose and to build a, a good a deep network. It's all... Um, you try or you use one that is proved to be good. This is the only way. So a few messages that I want you to remember from all this um, talk. So what deep learning is very hot research area today. It's the main idea. It's learns multiple levels of representation and uses end to end training. It achieved state of the art performance in a lot of applications in many areas, but it requires a lot of data for training and some magic skills to be able to build good network. So this is deep uh, learning. Okay, do you want to take like five minutes break or just 